Hey there, Extra Historians. Welcome to Lies, the part of the show where we tell you all the things we left out, the stuff we got wrong, and all of the reasons that I just seem very tired. Uh, hi, I'm Rob Rath. I'm the head writer of Extra History. This is our Empire of Ethiopia slash Kings of Solomon series. We'll talk about that name change. Uh, and I just want to say something quick at the top. Uh, if I seem a little bit weird or off or my voice is odd, uh, well, that's for two reasons. One, I'm still in the U.S., as you can see by my different background. Um, but also, I had COVID last week. Uh, so I, uh, if, you, if you see weird cuts of this episode, it's just because I have to stop and cough my lungs out every once in a while. Um, I'm fine. My family is fine. We all got sick. Um, but luckily, our symptoms were relatively mild. Don't get COVID. Yeah, pro tip, it's not nice. Uh, I, zero stars, my review, zero stars, do not recommend. So let's get on. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple things uh, up top. First of all, thank you so much to our patrons. I love that we can have a, a model where we can do history like this that is a little bit off the beacon, beaten track and where uh, patrons can vote for a series that they might vote for just because they don't know uh, about this area of the world and they want to learn more about it. Um, so thank you so much. I do also want to say, uh, if you are not a patron, uh, one of the reasons that you should be a patron or might want to be a patron is not only can you vote on these topics or propose uh, certain um, uh, subjects, but also you get a cool discount at our merch store where you can get things like Plush Zoe, uh, a game mug, or we have enamel pins now. I'm so excited about this. So we have like all the show logos. So I've got my little extra history pin. And then we have a monthly pin, which uh, the last month's pin was my boy, Ibn Battuta, who we'll talk about a little bit later, but I, I love my Ibn Battuta pin. So I had to wear it. The one that is currently on is the Dabbing Zoe. Um, and we'll see about next, uh, what, the, what the patrons vote uh, for the next pin. But, there should be a new one uh, coming out coming out monthly. Uh, first of all, let's start with recommended reading for this series, A History of Ethiopia by Harold G. Marcus. It's a textbook. Uh, it's a very good, solid source, though. Uh, the Fortunes of Africa by Martin Meredith. This one I used for all the uh, Prester John stuff uh, and kind of the, the European idea of Africa. Um, the Battle of Adwa, African Victory in the Age of Empire by Raymond Jonas. This is a fairly new book. It's very good. Um, this is, weirdly, this one I'm going to mention I did not read, but it's very notable, so I want to mention it anyway. Church and State in Ethiopia, 1270 to 1527 um, by Tadas Tamrat. Uh, I just wasn't able to get my hands on it. This is one of those times where it wasn't available digitally and getting it to Hong Kong was, was not going to happen in time. Um, but if you want, like, the classic book on uh, Ethiopian state building, this is it. Um, I do want to mention Tariq, the Ethiopian History Podcast. It's fantastic. It's done by Ethiopians. And it's, uh, if you want to get to, like, a level that is just way deeper than anything I could possibly do, this is this is where you go. It's a great show. Um, I will say you might want to brush up your Ethiopian history before you listen to it, because it's actually that granular, that it's not, it's not like a 101, uh, uh, 101 version of it. So yeah, I would say if you're going to like listen to a, uh, one of their podcasts, maybe like skim a Wikipedia article or like a, an article or something like that before you read it or listen to it. But it's a great show. Well, first of all, let's talk about the name change. For whatever reason, Ethiopian Empire was, was not... Um, playing to the algorithm. And, uh, you know, our goal is always not just to communicate history, but to get history to a place where people are, uh, it's reaching people. You know, we want more people to know about Ethiopian history. And I don't know why it could be something to do with, I'm completely spitballing here, but like perhaps because of the civil conflict that's going on in Ethiopia, certain uh, keywords are being de-emphasized to try and we tamp down on uh, um, on uh, content that is uh, promoting one side or another of the conflict. Uh, we have no idea why, but f for some reason, it just wasn't seeming to grab and reach people to a certain extent. So we try to change the keywords a little bit. Also, I just want to say with the maps, because we had 
come across online some historic maps that had kind of started some arguments about the current ongoing conflict, we decided to do a version of the maps that didn't represent like hard borders. Um, we didn't want to unintentionally throw weight be behind some kind of current political cause. And I didn't feel comfortable with my own knowledge uh, being sufficient to, uh, to make sure that didn't happen. And by the way, kind of fuzzy boundaries is mu a much more medieval way of thinking about territory anyway, rather than like a line on a map and have accurate geographic maps to put lines on at that point. Um, so let's jump in. Patron question from Hercules. When talking about relations with Egypt, you didn't mention the Bach that existed between Ethiopia and Arab empires that ruled Egypt. Uh, so this is a really fascinating uh, treaty that by some measures is considered the longest treaty in history. It comes into force after uh, Arabian troops conquer Egypt in 652 CE and lasts until the mid 14th century and kind of like waxes and wanes over those centuries though. But yes, it was with a African Christian kingdom, but it wasn't Ethiopia. There were, there were other um, Christian states in Africa, but they just didn't last. Uh, so this was with a Nubian Christian kingdom uh, called Makuria that is sort of like on the border of modern Sudan and, and southern Egypt. Um, so that that is a very cool thing, but that isn't necessarily an Ethiopian thing from what my, my understanding. Episode one, patron question from Ahmad Demen. It's, it's a little bit long, so I'm, we'll put the full thing up, but I'm going to paraphrase a little bit. Basically, he said that it's not true to say that Aksum was kicked out of Yemen because of Khosrow and the Persian invasion. It's a much more complicated story uh, and that Arab resistance to Aksumite presence actually predates Islam. Um, that is very interesting. I didn't know that actually. Uh, so this is this is very cool. Um, and that there is the rise of an Arab king called Saif ibn Di Yazan, who finally convinced the Persians to be his allies and that's who brought in Khosrow. Um, I, I don't really know much about this, so it's very fascinating. But uh, I did want to name check Khosrow because we have a really good series about him uh, that I would love to. You should definitely watch Khosrow the Great. It's a it's a cool series. Uh, question from YouTube: uh, I've been following your content for years, and I'm so glad you're telling the story of my homeland. I do have a question: Can you cite the sources that state that Yakuno Amlak slew the last Zogwe king to get the throne? Because in Ethiopian history. I've learned that uh, that the Zagwe rulers peacefully gave Yakuno Amlak the right to rule. Uh, this is from uh, Marcus's A History of Ethiopia. I saw it in other sources as well. I'm not gonna like die on this hill because clearly, you know, we can kind of get into this a little bit with the next question as well. A lot of Ethiopian history at this time is a world tradition and you know, the, the, the nature of like historical truth sometimes with oral traditions doesn't totally matter. Um, and I really, especially for this early, these early parts of it, I wanted to weave in Ethiopian oral traditions because they're important. Even if it's not quote unquote, what happened, what does that mean? It's important to understand the way that people currently, and as well as a few centuries ago, looked on their own history. Um, and I, I wanted to respect that and uh, incorporate it uh, because it's important, you know, the way the way people choose to remember things. And so for all I know, this story about him slaying the last Zagwe king could be true. The story about a peaceful transfer of power could be true. One of the reasons that I went with that, not only is the story that, uh, that I found in the, in the sources I read, but also because I think it makes sense that there is this kind of dramatic moment because there is very, a very clear attempt to sort of uh, uh, create a framework narrative where this, what seems to be a violent usurpation is justified. Um, now, speaking of oral traditions and legends, I wanna point out that uh, we talked about Queen Gudit. Uh, we don't name her, I think, in the series, but she's the non-Christian warrior, warrior queen who uh, uh, did, just totally wrecks the Aksumite kingdom. Um, and she is probably legendary. It seems like this figure was based on someone real. 
but we don't really know anything about her. The history of Ethiopia that I read, actually, she only appears in a footnote because she's considered like that kind of, her historicity is, is that challenge. Um, but, you know, it is cool that, uh, I, I wanted to put her, I wanted to put her in there. Again, respecting the oral tradition and understanding how the Solomonic dynasty saw itself. But um, uh, we just know that she's non-Christian. Sometimes she's described as Ethiopian Jewish. Sometimes she's described as pagan, uh, and it's it's sort of it's sort of a toss up, right? It's interesting that those are two groups that the Solomonic dynasty didn't always have great relations with. So it makes me wonder if it's like who she was supposed to be aligned with flipped back and forth on occasion. So it's like kind of the boogeyman of the moment, right? Uh, in, some in some legends, she's a former enslaved woman who'd had uh, a mastectomy, which is kind of cool. And so uh, you don't hear a lot of, a lot of that in, uh, in history. Let's move on to episode two, patron question from John Cox. In episode two at 414, the animation depicts the Ark being carried by hand in the biblical record. People ended up dead for doing this. Were the poles forgotten or admitted due to the animation schedule? Ah, uh, there's always one that bothers me, and this is going to be the one. Um, no, that's not. That's on me. I totally should have noticed that. Um, I'm. I'm not sure, to be honest, if the poles are necessarily a part of the Ethiopian tradition, but uh, I do know that the art references I threw in there uh, had them. I should have spotted it because I've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark probably 200 times. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, and uh, yeah, you need to have the poles or else your face melts off. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, he also notes that there are alternate theories of how the Ark got to Ethiopia, one being that a bunch of uh, Israelite priests didn't like the king they were serving under, so they took the Ark to Egypt and then like they weren't very welcome there, so they moved south. I'm obviously telling the story that is the foundation of uh, Ethiopia's uh, self-conception. So we're going with the, the version from the Kibbutz and Gust. Patron question from Marina de Morris. Always great questions. In episode two, at 648, I think you meant Egypt instead of Ethiopia as the mostly Muslim country led by the Mamluks, right? Yes. Yes, that's a rare audio error that slipped through. Um, and a patron question from Moin Asmi. Did Ethiopia actually try to devote the, d divert the flow of the Nile? How did that go? No, they never actually tried it. It was a thing that, that they would um, threaten every once in a while, but kind of never came to pass. Uh, that sounds like a really fun uh, alternate history timeline, though. Uh, Ethiopia diverts the Nile. Um, a couple people, including uh, our patron, Drunk Captain Crunch, as well as some YouTube commenters, mentioned that we had uh, a panel where uh, a figure flipped from a darker sub-Saharan African uh, skin tone to a lighter kind of North African skin tone. We actually ended up having to go back and do some palette swap some skin tone in this one. And the reason for that is, this is a super complicated series uh, when it comes to talking about religion versus ethnicity versus geographic origin point, right? Like when I said in the script, Muslim, that could mean an Arabian Muslim, a North African Muslim, a uh, Ethiopian Muslim. And there were uh, occasions where I, I went back and went, oh, oh no, I'm sorry, I, th this, you know, person should uh, should be a, a Sub-Saharan African Muslim, not a um, not like the, the skin tone we have for Arabia, uh, North Africa. So uh, we were trying to be as accurate for that as possible, and apparently we missed one frame where it flipped back. Uh, similarly, we, in one of those fixes, uh, the Mamluk Sultan got uh, a Sub-Saharan African skin tone when, in fact, he should have, uh, he would have been Tur uh, Turkic um, and Mongol, uh, that specific guy. So he would not uh, have been have been a dark-skinned. Episode three, YouTube question. I'd love to hear more about how other states perceived Ethiopia, where they could consider a middling power, a local power. That's really difficult to say, considering we have like a time scale in this series that's like a thousand years long. <laughs> I started to regret this about halfway through. I was like, what, what was I thinking trying to do the entire Solomonic dynasty and the Aksumite Empire? Why did I bring this on myself? Um, 
I would say that it, things waxed and waned just generally, and I'm basing this just on my sense, and I'm not going to die on this hill or whatever, but I would say Ethiopia was generally a local power that was competing with uh, Somali sultanates and that kind of thing, and, and, um, and Sudanese groups, and uh, also uh, trying to counter uh, the Mamluks or the Ottomans. But in general, that was through like proxy conflicts, not a direct competition uh, with Egypt. So I would say they were a local power that occasionally swelled to a regional power that affected the Red Sea uh, trade network and the, um, and the Indian Ocean trade network. Um, but that's, that's, that's just me being very general about a very long period of time. Uh, as a Portuguese, it brought me great joy to learn about this rescue of Ethiopia with us having done so much harm to other parts of Africa. It's nice to learn we did some good. That was a funny comment. Um, a lot of people said uh, Queen Eleni needs her, new, uh, her own series. I wish we knew enough about her that was very uh, well-sourced that, that we could do a full series. I, unfortunately, I don't think so. Um, but she is a major national hero in Ethiopia and is very well regarded. Uh, episode four, YouTube question. Just to mention that the Adal general that we kept talking about, who was killed at the beginning of episode four, is Ahmad ibn Ibrahim al-Ghazi, who was both a general and an imam in the Adal Sultanate. And um, like kind of a sultan too? Uh, a, little, a little bit of like, a, I'm, not, I'm not the emperor, I'm the first citizen kind of thing. Uh, also known as Ahmad Gran. Uh, I've also seen him called Ahmad Giri. Uh, basically means Ahmad the left-handed. Uh, this guy is a huge deal in, in Somalia. He's a big national hero, considered to be uh, the main figure for counting, countering Ethiopian aggression. In Ethiopia, he's known as the guy who invaded and destroyed a lot of cultural and religious sites. So that's, uh, that's an interesting flip. And someone mentioned a, a legend that's associated with this, this battle where the Portuguese end up killing, uh, killing Ahmad. The emperor of Ethiopia at the time promised his sister's hand to any man, man capable of killing Ahmad in battle. The name of this Portuguese soldier was João de Castillo, and he died after killing Ahmad. Yeah, like many things in this series, there are multiple legends associated with it, right? There's also a story that a teenaged Ethiopian cavalryman uh, killed the general while he was uh, fleeing the battlefield. So we picked one and ran with it, and, and that's why we have lies. Uh, one comment said, I'm surprised you brushed over the uh, suppression of the indigenous church so quickly. Yes, uh, that's for a couple of reasons. One is every time I started trying to get into religious conflict stuff, it ended up explaining the conflicts and the different groups. And that got very complicated and taking up a lot of space very quickly. And since we were doing a long time scale, I just didn't really have time for that. Um, and someone said, if you have a cop capital in Gondar, a civil war breaks out and you don't say, make a Gondor calls for aid joke. Major failure, my apologies. Episode five, uh, YouTube question, it bears mentioning that Theodros just means Theodore. So a lot of Westerners um, called, or Europeans called him Emperor Theodore. Um, and we had a couple comments of a thing that actually was cut from the episode is, the reason that Britain is suddenly getting all its cotton from the Ottoman Empire and Egypt uh, and Turkey is because of the U.S. Civil War, right? There's a Union blockade on the cotton-producing regions of the American South, and not only can they not get the cotton, but they're starting to feel a little bit weird about buying the cotton. So uh, suddenly they switch suppliers, and that changes their uh, international stance. One person said, I, I wish that you had brought up the Sebastopol, which is the first uh, heavy piece of artillery made in Ethiopia. Um, yeah, I saved this for lies. There were so many, so many Teotro stories. In retrospect, I wish I had shortened the era of the prince's uh, episode and done kind of like the first half of Teodros' reign and then had a full episode for the end of it. Um, but, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, in it's learning, <laughs> but I probably should have given him more time because there are so many cool stories. But one of them is that, you know, he got all these English and German engineers to try and make heavy artillery in Ethiopia and make a cannon foundry. And they made this giant 6.7 ton mortar, which when the British expedition arrived, they tried to drag it up to his fortress and it just was too heavy. And so they left it and it's still there like half buried. 
you can go see it. Uh, and there's a cast iron uh, replica of it in Teodro Square. Um, but it's, it's just enormous. It's a huge, huge mortar. Um, and I think it's so interesting what it was named because it's called the Sevastopol gun or the Sevastopol gun. And um, that the Crimean War had been going on. And this was the inspiration they had for like, we need a modern cannon foundry with big, big guns. And it just shows that Teodros and in general, the Ethiopian state was very globally minded at this time, right? They're tracking stuff that's going on in Russia. Uh, they're tracking the status of the Crimean War and military technologies that are starting to um, advance in other parts of the world. So I, to me, it just shows how global Ethiopia could be at this time. Someone said, I'd love to see a high budget five season TV series about Teodros. It's like an absolutely jaw dropping life. Yeah, uh, there are a few things that I wish I had put in that, that were like visual, but we didn't call them out specifically. In both European and, um, and Ethiopian art, he's like surrounded by these two lions that are always by his throne. He just had like pet lions he hung out with. Um, and this is like a, a very common way he's, he's, he's pictured. Um, he also has a lion mane hanging from his shield, if you notice that. Uh, and that was like a special thing for his Royal Guard Officer Corps. And um, that is in the British Museum. A lot of uh, artifacts related to Teodros were looted and then taken back to the UK and put in the British Museum. And Ethiopia has asked for them to be returned um, and generally nothing, right? Um, another quite sad coda to that is we mentioned that Teodros' son uh, Teodros wanted his son to go into British protection because he worried about him being killed in a succession crisis. What ends up happening is his son just like disappears basically into British custody. They like they're like okay, and then they take him back to the UK, and he never comes back to Ethiopia, and he lives this very sad kind of life. As depending on how you look at it, either like an exile or a hostage. It's just a really, really sad story. And a lot of people in Ethiopia like really consider him to have been kidnapped and, you know, left to, he, he died not only a few years later, quite young. With, and oh God, is it the, the memorial plaque they set up for him too is just totally self-congratulatory of like, look how great we were taking care of this, this kid that didn't have a home anymore. Um, it's like, yeah, but you also kind of like took him away from his home and they never got to come back. Episode six. Uh, I actually can't respond to episode six because this has to be taped before it goes live. But here's what I'm gonna do. Um, this is why we don't do an episode six most of the time because I can't address it in lies. Uh, I will have a link down in the description or in a pinned comment. Um, and we'll have a public post on our Patreon where I could respond to uh, anything I think is notable that, that needs to be brought up from there. Um, and speaking of Patreon, uh, we are a Patreon funded show. You can vote on topics. You can, um, request, uh, certain topics. Coming up on Extra History, Eleanor of Aquitaine. This is going to be a super fun medieval marriage shenanigans series. This is the only woman to have been Queen of France and Queen of England. She married the King of France. It didn't work out. They got their marriage annulled. She then went and married the guy who became King of England. She is a fascinating figure. And then of course her kids are Richard the Lionheart and King John and uh, basically a just horrible brood of backstabbers that she constantly had to try and uh, keep in line. Fascinating woman. Um, after that, the Easter Rising, Ireland's Day of Reckoning. Uh, this is about the, the event that kicked off the uh, the Irish War of Independence and a diplomatic history of Pearl Harbor. I'm so excited about this one. As you know, I'm from Hawaii and I'm really enjoying casting this very familiar event in terms that people are probably not going to have seen very much before. Um, I'll just leave you with this short snippet, which is the headquarters of the US Pacific Fleet was not Pearl Harbor. They would generally be in San Diego they were there specifically to put pressure on Japan. Um, so they were a little bit exposed out there. Uh, so that'll get you a little bit into like the diplomatic wrangling that is going on. Uh, our next vote, 
uh, because our patrons get to vote on our, uh, they get to suggest topics, and then they get to vote on those topics, is the great. So Frederick the Great, uh, we could do, it could be someone who is great in their field of scientific expertise, uh, but we're talking the greats, Alexander, etc. Ibn Battuta side trip. This is an actual Ibn Battuta side trip. Ibn Battuta side trip. So during our Ibn Battuta series, we didn't really spend a lot of time in the East Africa portion um, because he went everywhere. So you have to minimize something. He stopped for one day in the Empire of Ethiopia in a port called Zelia, and he did not like it. Um, he went to see the bazaar, and it is not only a port city that handles like a lot of African goods going into the Red Sea. Uh, it also is a major fishing port. So there are dead fish everywhere and people are slaughtering camels for meat. And the smell is so offensive to him that he actually ends up spending the night on board his boat uh, and uh, refusing to come off again. And even though it's kind of like choppy water and not the greatest sleep, uh, he named it, quote, the dirtiest, most disagreeable and most stinking town in the world. Uh, why am I bringing this up? Um, first of all, I think his reaction is probably colored by the fact that Ethiopia is the first Christian uh, kingdom he visited, ever. Um, and even though the port city is generally majority Muslim, right, these are the people that uh, Ethiopia made accommodations with so that it could be part of that uh, Indian Ocean trade network and the Red Sea, um, Red sea uh, network of ports. I think that probably colored his reactions a little bit, that maybe there was some stuff going on in a dietary sense that, that offended him, um, and he got grossed out, as Ibn Battuta, as we know, regularly did. I do love pointing this out because um, when we imagine these cities, we are so lucky that occasionally we get someone like Ibn Battuta who can give us like the sights and smells and experiential details uh, of the past, even when he's doing it because he's like a little bit of a jerk and is very easily disgusted by things. Again, if you watch our Ibn Battuta series, you will know he is constantly making horrible judgments on places. Yes, I'm, I'm, I was very excited. I'm like, oh yes, we get to do an Ibn Battuta one. Again, my dude. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. And I will see you next time. The biggest easy thanks to Ahmed Ziad Turk, Alicia Bramble, Angelo Valenciana, Arcalite Games, Casey Mustia, Dominic Valenciana, and Joseph Blaine for being legendary patrons.